the day. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, here we have Nishith Vishnoy from Yale. He's going to tell us about optimization and sampling under continuous symmetry. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. Thanks for the uh, uh, st sticking out. It's towards the end of the boot camp. And uh, we already heard uh, two really great talks today about the role symmetries play in computational problems. Uh, in this talk, uh, which is a two part talk, uh, the second one will be given by Jonathan Leake. We are going to be looking at uh, optimization and sampling problems under continuous symmetries. And the first part of the talk, which I'm going to give, is going to give you some simple examples and also speculate about why symmetries arise and, 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 and also show you a little bit in the forward, in the future, uh, you know, what to expect in Jonathan's talk. Uh, I should just point out that uh, Jonathan and I just wrote up a survey on our talks. It's uh, available on the archive now in case you want to look at uh, more details. And the talks are based on primarily on these uh, on this survey. So it's so a lot of details which I might skip or Jonathan might skip would be there in these uh, notes. Okay, so uh, so what are symmetries? Uh, so so symmetries, you know, have been uh, uh, you know, humans have been fascinated with symmetries for a very long time. I'll just use a quote from Herman Weil, which, uh, which kind of succinctly summarizes uh, symmetries. Uh, a thing is symmetrical if there is something you can do to it so that after you have finished doing it, it looks the same as before. So this is one, uh, one way you can think about symmetries. To give some examples, we have already seen many, but uh, let me just give a few more examples, uh, some basic ones. So uh, very simple ones. So you can you can think of a polynomial uh, in variables x1 to xn, which is uh, x1 squared plus dot 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 plus xn squared. Uh, this is a polynomial, which is uh, an example of a symmetric polynomial permuting its variables uh, does not change the value, uh, does not change the polynomial. Uh, perhaps the audience here is also familiar with uh, uh, you know, sets like the Boolean hypercube, uh, which has these symmetries uh, in coordinates. And I guess uh, going back uh, thousands of years, uh, people realize symmetries of objects like squares, uh, which you, you, know, you can rotate the square by 90 degrees, 180 degrees and so on. It doesn't really change uh, the square itself. So this is a continuous object. A square is a continuous object, which has all these discrete symmetries. So sphere, which is also a continuous object, has this uh, continuous set of symmetries. You can rotate it by an arbitrary amount and it still doesn't change, it remains invariant. Uh, perhaps more relevant to this talk are matrices and in particular uh, uh, matrices which are complex and Hermitian. So this is just uh, uh, the complex cousin of symmetric matrices, which we are all familiar with. And we can look at the eigenvalues of such matrices. So we know that eigenvalues are all real for such matrices. Um, if I conjugate these matrices by unitary matrices, the eigenvalues don't change. So if you are, for instance, interested in the eigenvalues of a matrix, you expect symmetries to creep in. So these are some very, very basic examples of uh, where discrete and continuous symmetries um, play a role. Um, I guess um, uh, this is not a talk about the role of symmetries in physics and mathematics, but I would be amiss if I did not point out the great uh, and major role symmetries have played both in physics and mathematics. In particular, symmetries have guided the search of fundamental laws of physics. Uh, I guess we are all familiar with uh, things like special relativity and general relativity. These are all arrived at through symmetry principles of various types, whether symmetry of space, symmetry of time, symmetry of reference frames, and so on. And um, symmetry in physics gives rise to conservation laws, uh, which was discovered by Emmy Noether. Um, and, 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 and so whenever you see a conserved quantity, uh, physicists try to look for uh, potentially hidden symmetries in the laws of physics. There's a beautiful article in the Quanta magazine uh, which you can look at this picture is from there. I should also mention that a talk I gave a couple of days ago on Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, even though I did not use the word symmetry, 
I did talk about conservation laws, like conservation of uh, uh, the Hamiltonian or the conservation of the volume. These are all consequences of Noether's theorem and the symmetries of Hamiltonian dynamics uh, that uh, were kind of implicit in my exposition. In mathematics, uh, uh, continuous symmetries, uh, which are encoded by Lie groups, are extremely central to many, many branches of mathematics. Uh, and I guess you saw in Avi's talk, all these connections uh, that he and his group have made uh, are, are, are not completely accidental. Um, there are many, many connections that exist, uh, even to discrete objects like combinatorics. And you'll see why even though we may focus on continuous symmetries, uh, in the end, discrete symmetries arise very naturally. And so that's a theme that you will see in this talk arising a couple of times. So, uh, uh, so, so coming back to this workshop, uh, which is about uh, oh, so the semester, which is about optimization and sampling. So I should mention that uh, symmetries uh, do play a role in optimization and sampling in particular coming up with efficient algorithms for problems uh, uh, which are uh, uh, you know, intrinsically optimization and sampling problems. There is a growing body of work and here I present just a very, very partial list um, starting with uh, some works of Barbin Oak, uh, Blackerman in 2003, uh, these objects called orbitopes in case you haven't heard of. So these are orbits of objects under group act, uh, sorry, convex hulls of orbits uh, uh, under group actions. Uh, so for example, you could look at, um, let's say, um, you know, a spanning tree in a graph and you can apply certain, uh, you can permute the edges by some symmetry group. So you get a bunch of discrete objects. You take the convex hull and you start getting very interesting polytopes. For example, you can obtain the TSP polytope in this manner and so on. So this is an interesting area of uh, study, uh, uh, both for discrete groups and continuous groups. Uh, interestingly, it also has connections with spectrohedral uh, representations. So orbitopes, often are not convex, they are convex bodies, but they are not polytopes. Uh, and one may ask if you can represent them in, in, in some interesting manner and some very beautiful and deep results, uh, uh, more recent results, for example, by Covert show that these objects have spectrohedral representations. So I'm pointing it out because there is a lot of work in uh, optimization and theoretical computer science concerning spectrohedra. Then I guess we saw a whole bunch of works, uh, uh, starting with the work of Gerd Gurwitz, uh, Olivia and Vigderson in 2016 on a variety of connections and algorithms between optimization, complexity theory and invariance. And some really amazing uh, connections specifically uh, to, uh, between complexity theory and uh, you know, optimization as Avi's uh, talk pointed out. And uh, more recently, uh, so with Jonathan and Colin, we have been looking at various optimization and sampling problems over uh, symmetric manifolds, such as unitary orbits, which I'm going to explain. And these have also end up having a variety of connections, uh, starting from interior point methods in optimization to problems in statistics, uh, machine learning, differential privacy, quantum inference, and so on. So, um, there is, uh, there is something to be said about uh, the role symmetries are, have been playing in the last few years in designing optimization and sampling uh, algorithms. So let me start with a very basic question, which I'm afraid I will not be able to answer to the satisfaction of the audience, but I'll try anyways. So why do symmetries arise? So uh, in, in, a, in a very, uh, very succinctly, I would say that you know, symmetries arise because the functions that we might be optimizing encode usually some physical or geometric quantities. Uh, for instance, these could be distances, inner products, volumes, determinants, and so on. And, uh, uh, and, and as we know that, you know, uh, often we are working with in continuous domains with things like vectors, matrices, and tensors, and these objects themselves represent some geometric spaces and there is not necessarily a unique way to represent. Uh, when I mean, use the word representation here, it's not in the 
sense of representation theory, but just in the ordinary English way, uh, that we choose to represent physical objects using uh, degenerate uh, objects like vectors, matrices, and tensors. And as a consequence, when we optimize uh, uh, functions of these, uh, the, over these, these, you know, these objects, uh, symmetries and invariants arise pretty naturally. So I'll give you a very trivial example, which nevertheless makes this point. So consider this function uh, x1 to xn of x1 to xn, where xi is, let's say, live in some Euclidean space. And we are interested in the function, which is if it just measures the pairwise distance squared. So a couple of things that you may note is that if I translate each vector x1 by some other vector c, um, so each vector is translated by the same vector c, uh, the function doesn't change. Similarly, if I uh, rotate each vector xi with the same rotation matrix, uh, so q is a rotation matrix, then also the function doesn't change. Um, Besides a function, the domain itself might have symmetries. So here is an example which will come up in this talk, which is the complex unit sphere. So this is nothing but the set of uh, uh, n complex numbers whose magnitude square sums up to one. So this has, uh, this has uh, the following type of symmetries. If you take a unitary matrix U, so just to kind of uh, quickly uh, recall a unitary matrix is a matrix which is, uh, uh, you know, if you multiply it with its conjugate uh, uh, transpose, its identity. Okay, so it's uh, a rotation matrix is something, if it's, it's, it's a real matrix, if you multiply it with its transpose, its identity. So if I look at uh, an action of the unitary matrix on this complex sphere defined as just take every point on this complex unit sphere and pre-multiply it with this uh, unitary matrix, I get back the sphere. So this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, a, a very simple explanation, but I guess the big point here is the following. But first of all, these symmetries form a group and this is where algebra comes in, okay? So you can take two vectors C1 and C2 and first translate by C1 and then translate by C2. Uh, and you're gonna get a new vector C1 plus C2, which will also belong to this group of symmetries. Similarly, you can take a unitary matrix U1 and take another unitary matrix U2, first apply U1 and then apply U2. So the product of U2, U1 is also a unitary matrix. And a set of all unitary matrices actually uh, composed under this multiplication and they form a group. And so they have some algebraic structure, but that's not it. Uh, if that was it, we wouldn't be having this talk actually. So, so what is more interesting is that these set of objects, like the set of unitary matrices or the set of vectors, well, in the set of vector case, it's obvious that this is just the space, this, the, the group here is just the set of all uh, vectors in RD. So RD is uh, the Euclidean space. It has a huge amount of structure. In particular, it's uh, the most simple example of a manifold. Um, the unitary group, which is the collection of all unitary matrices also has a manifold structure. And the moment you have a manifold structure, uh, well, it's much more than that. It's in fact, even an algebraic variety, but I'm not gonna go into that direction in this talk. But the moment you have an uh, uh, a uh, manifold structure, you can do uh, calculus and analysis on this. So really algebra and analysis kind of marry together in, this, in these kinds of problems and the right mathematical uh, object that arises when you have a group structure, which, is, which also is a manifold and, and these two things are compatible with each other is, is what is called a Lie group. So while we may hide away from trying to understand Lie groups, which is what I'm gonna do in this talk, it becomes absolutely necessary uh, to understand Lie group theory, um, to, to understand the significant generalizations of the results that I'm going to talk about, and also to, uh, to, to really even understand why the proofs that I'm going to present at this talk are even, they, they, they even uh, I mean, they, they will look mysterious. So I'll, I'll take a pause before I go into the examples I'm gonna cover in this talk to see if anybody has a quick question.
Okay, so so the in this talk, I'm going to look at two uh, pretty simple examples uh, to make this point. So the first one is this well-known optimization characterization of the minimum eigenvalue problem. So given an n cross and Hermitian matrix A, let's say the eigenvalues are ordered lambda one less than lambda two and so on. Um, the basic theorem in linear algebra tells you that, or, or this kind of variational characterization of the smallest eigenvalue is that if we minimize this quadratic form, we, start, we, we conjugate transpose AV over the domain of vectors V, which ranges over the complex unit sphere, then the answer to this problem is the smallest eigenvalue of the matrix A. There are many, many proofs on this theorem, um, but I'll present one which is particularly illustrative and generalizes heavily. Uh, in the sampling world, I'm going to talk about a related problem, which is which you can view as some kind of a robust version of this optimization problem, where instead of outputting the minimum uh, you try to sample from of the Gibbs density corresponding to this function B star AB. So the problem is the following. Again, you're given a matrix A with eigenvalues lambda one to lambda N. And I would like to sample from this density E to the minus V star AV, where V is on the complex unit sphere. And in particular, I'll focus on a related problem of integrating, which is really just computing the partition function of this density over the un complex unit sphere. So this is a measure on the complex unit sphere. And this, I'm not sure how many people have seen this result. This is not at all obvious. I mean, unlike this, which I expect all the audience members to know, this one is more mysterious. Uh, surprisingly, this integral over this continuous object ends up having a summation, I mean, a very small uh, formula, and which is exact. Okay, so it, it's written in terms of eigenvalues because everything here is invariant under unitary transformations or conjugation by unitaries. So we're going to see proofs of both of these theorems in this talk. But the first question you might ask is, okay, you know, you gave a, uh, you talked about symmetries. So, so where are the symmetries here? So to, to start seeing that, uh, let's define this set P sub one, which is the set of all matrices which are obtained as follows. So you, you fix this matrix, which I call E sub one, which is nothing but the following matrix. It has exactly one entry, which is non-zero, which is the one comma one entry. And all the other entries are zero. So I call this E one. And what you can look at is the conjugation of this matrix E1 uh, with all possible n cross n unitary matrices. So this is a set. In fact, this is uh, an example of an orbit under the action, conjugation action of the unitary group of this matrix E1. Uh, this is, uh, this is a non-convex set. So, I mean, I should mention, I probably forgot to mention that these are, this problem is a non-convex optimization problem. Okay, so this function, I mean, this, this set is not convex. And in general, when A is not positive semi-definite, this function is also not convex. <coughs> okay, so, so this P1 is, uh, is, not a, is, is not a convex set. And yet, uh, uh, we can, I mean, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is just, just write these theorems, rewrite these theorems uh, with respect to this domain P1, because they are both either optimizing or sampling something from this. So the, the, so the first theorem, which is about this minimum eigenvalue can be reformulated as saying that we want to minimize a linear, uh, a linear function over this orbit P1. And the linear function is the Frobenius inner product of A and X. So we are optimizing a linear function over a non-convex um, object. 
So why is that the case? Because, well, okay, so, so this is, you can rewrite this, inner, this quantity as A Frobenius inner product VV star, and VV star is a rank one matrix, a rank one projection matrix. And, so, and, and, and this is the set of all rank one projection matrices. So while I don't prove this formally, it's not too difficult to see that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the complex unit sphere and P1. They're not the same objects, but there is a one-to-one -one mapping. And this one-to-one -one mapping also gives you some mapping between measures through push forward maps. So uh, for theorem two, you can now look at this uh, exponential density. So this is now a linear function. <laughs> so it's an exponential density over this object P1. So this integral now is over P1. And, and, and our goal would be to prove this theorem. So the proof strategy uh, in both of these cases at a very high level works as follows. So there'll be some non-convex object, okay? Um, which I illustrate using the boundary of the sphere. The first step would be to convert the problem, whether it's optimization or sampling to some kind of a convex polytope, which here is just the probability simplex. And subsequently, we will further go from the polytope to some discrete object. Okay, in this case, uh, here just SN, the symmetry group. But just pictorially, I mean, this is what you're going to see happen two times in this talk. That we started off from uh, on, on some non-convex, but symmetric non-convex set. Uh, we translated the problem to a, um, to a polytope, and then from a polytope, we go to a, to a discrete set. So this also illustrates a very beautiful connection between discrete and continuous symmetries. And the part two of this uh, two part lectures will, will introduce the right uh, notation and definitions that we need to even make this stuff uh, formal and present the generalizations of these two theorems. Um, that I will speak about. Any questions about the, the, the results before I... So the rest of the talk is going to be uh, roughly divided into two parts. In the first part, we are going to be talking about the proof of theorem one. And in the second part, we're going to be giving a proof of theorem two. And then we'll conclude with some uh, remarks. Nishid? Yeah. Are you thinking of theorem one as like a limiting case of theorem two or something like this? Uh, Just wondering the connection. That, that's right. So yeah, I think, uh, so, so you can put another, I mean, yeah. So, so there is a, there is a, uh, yeah. If I put in like a temperature here and, and let the, uh, you know, temperature go to, uh, you know, I think it's, yeah, to, to zero then, uh, then you, you start getting things like this. Yeah. So, so that's a very general connection between optimization and sampling. If you want to, I mean, you can always go from sampling to optimization by introducing a temperature and then and take a limiting value of that temperature. Yeah, I should mention that this theorem makes sense only when all the lambdas are distinct, uh, but you can generalize it once you know the multiplicities of the eigenvalues. It's not too difficult. Okay, so I'll continue with the proof of uh, the first theorem. So the proof will be in this slide itself. And in the next slide, we are going to talk about the generalization or, or heading, start heading towards the generalization of this theorem. But first let's look at the proof of this. So recall that what we would like to prove is um, the following, that we have this uh, unitary orbit of this diagonal matrix with just one in the one comma one entry and zero everywhere else. 
And we have this linear function that you would like to optimize over this unitary orbit. The first thing we can do is to unwind this unitary orbit and phrase the problem just as a problem optimization problem over the unitary group. And that's exactly, so this is just by just decoding what it means to be an element of P1. An element of P1 is exactly uh, uh, a matrix of the form U E1 U star where U belongs to a unitary group. So let's, uh, uh, you know, because there are just so many unitaries involved, uh, let, let's try to kind of also simplify the matrix A a little bit. So one thing we'll do is to first write down A, uh, the spectral decomposition of A as another unitary W times a diagonal, which consists of its eigenvalues times the unitary star, the same unitary star. So this follows from a spectral decomposition theorem <coughs> that you can do this. And then we can just plug instead of A, the W, D, W star here. Okay, so that's uh, step one. Uh, we can use the fact that inner products are invariant, the Frobenius inner product is invariant under conjugation by unitaries to move all the unitaries to the, to the left-hand side here. And we get something like this. We know that the set of unitary, uh, the, the set of unitaries forms a group. So U star W is also a unitary. We call it V. So the problem reduces to the following equivalent problem that minimize over all unitary matrix, matrices V such that V D V star, the, the inner product of, I mean, the Frobenius inner product of V D V star and E1, okay? So what is it saying? It's saying that you take some diagonal matrix, you conjugate it by unitaries, and you just look at the first entry, the one comma one entry in this, uh, in this conjugated matrix. What could it be? So the task becomes to understand what happens to diagonal matrices when we conjugate them by unitaries. So diagonal matrices are special types of Hermitian matrices. So, and when we look at the conjugation of uh, diagonal matrices by uh, unitary matrices, we get a different type of uh, a group structure, which uh, I will refer to at the end of the proof of this. But right now, let's just do elementary mathematics. So the proof of this, uh, you can ignore all the group theory and just focus on uh, elementary mathematics, if you like. Uh, so, so what is the diagonal entry of VDV star? So the diagonal entry of VDV star, just by writing, is, uh, let's say, you know, AII. Okay, sorry, this A has nothing to do with that A. This is probably just overload of notation. Uh, so AII is the sum over j of vij lambda j vij star. This is just what it means to be a diagonal entry. So we can rewrite this as vij, I mean the, the, the absolute value of vij squared times lambda j. Now here we do, a, we make a small observation that if we denote this quantity vij square by qij, then because v was a unitary matrix, q ends up being a doubly stochastic matrix. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the uh, one of the first uh, simple but important observations in this, uh, in this proof. So what this is, this is a very basic fact. It says that if you have a unitary matrix and you look at the Hadamard product, which is just taking the entries as, you know, square. I mean, essentially conjugating and then multiplying each IJ entry, then the matrix that you get is a doubly stochastic matrix. And what's a doubly stochastic matrix? It has come up <coughs> earlier, but let me just recall. Uh, it's a matrix where every row sum and every column sum is equal to one. 
And Q gets this property because U U star is identity and U star U is also identity. So incidentally, the set of all doubly stochastic matrices is a polytope. Okay. This is a theorem of, uh, well, this is a very old theorem. I, I, uh, you know, I don't know who this is, but at least a hundred years old. Um, and this polytope is called the Birkhoff polytope. Moreover, the famous Birkhoff von Neumann theorem tells us that this polytope, which is a set of all doubly stochastic matrices, is a convex combination of all permutation matrices. So what's a permutation matrix? A permutation matrix is uh, over L N elements is an N cross N matrix where in the uh, in each row and each column, there is exactly one, one and rest zeros. And the, the entry in the I, the, the one in the I uh, row is exactly the, the position where a permutation sigma maps I to. So I guess everyone here has seen these objects. And this theorem is also not a big surprise. This is uh, the most basic theorem in, um, in optimization, discrete optimization. Um, matchings, for example, get a lot of the nice properties because of this structure. <coughs> so what we have proved in this, in this set of, uh, through this set of equalities is the following. That any unitary V, for any unitary V, if I look at the diagonal of V D V star, so I should remark that D is a diagonal matrix, but V D V star is not necessarily a diagonal matrix. Okay, it could be a general matrix with non-diagonal entries. So unitaries don't preserve their diagonalness, um, and that's why we are even looking at it. So what we have proved in these two lines of uh, equality is that for any unitary V, the diagonal of VDV star is Q lambda, uh, where Q is some doubly stochastic matrix, which we know from Birkhoff uh, von Neumann theorem can be written as a convex combination of permutation matrices. So in essence, you can write the diagonal as a convex combination of permutations of lambda. So you apply that corresponding permutation matrix on lambda. So you get a permutation of lambda itself. So these are now vectors. In, um, so this is an N cross N matrix and we have a projection map which takes this N cross N matrix and maps it to a vector of length N. So this is another polytope. Uh, let's call it P sub lambda, which is the following polytope. You take a vector lambda, you look at all its permutations, uh, which is uh, by action of the group, symmetric group Sn. So you're gonna get N factorial, not necessarily distinct vectors. And you take the convex cell of all these vectors. So this polytope lives in N dimensions, okay? The Birkhoff von Neumann polytope lives in N square dimensions. And in some sense, the Birkhoff von Neumann uh, sorry, the Birkhoff polytope is some kind of an extend, you know, extension of this, uh, this polytope. So this actually is sufficient for us to get the result now that to prove the main theorem. So what we can see from here is, so we haven't proved, uh, 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 yeah, so what we have proved is uh, the diagonals of diagonal matrices conjugated by unitaries uh, live inside a polytope, which we call P lambda, okay? So, so P lambda is a bigger set in some sense. So we get this inequality that the minimum over the set of unitaries is at least the minimum over a set of vectors in P lambda. But this is, I mean, so, so, so what is, uh, so, so this is fairly easy to see, right? Now we are, have a linear optimization problem over a polytope. We know that the solution will be at a vertex. We know what each vertex is. Each vertex is uh, just some permutation of lambda. And we have to, we are only picking up the first entry of this permutation of lambda. So which permutation will minimize this? Well, the one that picks up the smallest eigenvalue. 
So we, we can solve this problem straightforwardly using our understanding of basic uh, linear optimization. And the other direction is uh, not too difficult. I mean, this is a minimum over all permutation, all sorry, unitary matrices. You can plug in a special one that diagonalizes A and puts the first eigenvalue in one comma one entry. And so you can get the other inequality. And so you are done. Any questions about this, uh, this proof? I don't know if many people have seen this proof. Um, um, this is not the, the proof that you will be taught in the class uh, uh, if, uh, you know, where you would be proving this theorem. Okay, so let's move on. So here's where uh, uh, we'll try to make things a little bit more interesting. So we have this one slide where we will now start zooming out and say, you know, what really happened here? So first of all, uh, this fact that we proved that the, you know, the, 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 uh, the projection of the dia uh, of the projection of unitary conjugations of a diagonal matrix is contained in P lambda, uh, the converse is also true, that you get exactly P lambda, I mean, and you get nothing, I mean, that you can go back, which means that for any vector V, which is in the convex cell of permutations of lambda, you can go back and find a unitary such that this vector is a diagonal of UDU star. The proof of this is not particularly difficult. Um, I, I would leave it as an exercise. So the first part is typically referred to as a sure part of this theorem, and the second part is referred to as a horn part of this theorem. So in, uh, in other words, <clears throat> um, uh, what we have proved is that projection onto the diagonal of all unity matrices in the conjugation orbit of Hermitian, uh, of Hermitian is a polytope. Okay, so I've highlighted in, in wor uh, you know, words in red, which seem very accidental, but these all generalize. So we can talk about projection operators. There is a way to talk about diagonal. There is a, talk, a way to talk about conjugation. And there is a particular polytope that will arise if you do this in full generality. But we'll come to that and, and you'll see more of it in the second talk. Moreover, uh, well, this is a relatively straightforward fact, which we already saw that, uh, well, this is kind of the definition of P lambda that the polytope P lambda is just the convex hull of not any set of vectors, but vectors which are generated very systematically. You have this vector lambda, you apply every possible permutation to this lambda, and then you look at the convex hull of it. So it may seem very coincidental that some discrete group shows up, so what? I mean, you know, this is not a particularly uh, a point worth mentioning at least, you know, but, but you will see that, you know, there is the, 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 the discrete group that arises here is not at all an accident. But with this Schurhorn theorem, we can already prove something a bit more general than what we just proved. So instead of just the matrix E1, which was the diagonal uh, matrix with one and zeros, you can prove this theorem for any diagonal D prime, okay? that the optimization problem over a unitary group uh, reduces to some kind of uh, optimization problem over the permutation group. <clears throat> well, permutations are special types of unitary, so this is important. So permutations are, so this, this group here, SN, is a discrete subgroup of UN. So what will we, what will we see in part two? In part two, we are going to see a generalization of the Schurhorn theorem to compact groups, And this is, uh, this is a famous uh, and important theorem called Kostan's convexity theorem. Conjugation uh, will be replaced by something which will be called a joint action. Diagonal matrices uh, will generalize to something called maximal torus or if you're working in the Lie algebra, it's a Cartan sub algebra. And, and projection, which implicitly uses some kind of an inner product, uh, will require a very carefully chosen uh, bilinear form called the killing form. 
And what happens to the permutation group? This is where this object's so-called variant group uh, arise. Uh, so you're going to see all this uh, uh, stuff hopefully in part two. But the punchline uh, would be that linear optimization over adjoint orbits of D groups reduces to linear optimization over convex polytopes. So this is the, the generalization that you get once you're ready to learn a little bit of Lie group theory. Okay, so since I'm gonna to switch to the proof of the second theorem, I'll take a 30 second break to see if anybody has questions at this point. I have a question. Um, can we generalize this to infinite dimensional settings? To infinite dimensional settings? Yeah, um, but the eigenvalue problem is still well defined. Uh, right, it's a good question. So, um, well, these, I mean, I, yeah, so I mean, I guess I, I do use finite dimensional and compact groups here, uh, but yeah, so I, 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 I would say, I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I'll think about it or um, that's all I can say at this point. So saying no would not be, because I, I don't know if you cannot do that. Yeah, sure. Question? Uh, suppose we optimize over tensor as opposed to quadratic form, which is now a hard problem, but can it also be represented as reformulated as some convex optimization problem, which would be presumably convex over very large dimension or exponentially large dimension. But is there some notion of this in for tensor optimization? Um. So I think all of this stuff generalizes when you start allowing uh, more complicated representations than just the adjoint action. And there are experts probably sitting in the room uh, like uh, Cole and Avi who would probably uh, feel free to answer that question, Avi or Cole. So do, do you mean like something like V tensor V tensor V yeah. against something else? Against the tensor, so A maximize A in a product B tensor B to the B. It's a hard problem. Yeah, uh, but whether there's some you know structure like this. Yeah, I don't know. So I guess the thing which I, I don't fully understand about this is is what kind of linear functions you are, have to optimize over the adjoint orbit. Maybe the answer might depend on that. Yeah, I'm not sure for now, but. Uh, I, I doubt there's a simple generalization that looks like this. We don't have the linear algebra, we don't have diagonalization of tensors, and I, yeah. I, mean, I don't know any, and I suspect it would uh, be far more complex if you go to higher dimensions. So I would also point uh, the questioner to the works of Bern Stumfelds and others. Uh, so often, I mean, they, they have a slightly different approach to this, which is, you know, so they convexify these objects. So instead of working, I mean, so maybe it is actually a hard object to optimize over. So one thing you could do is to convexify it. And that's where this term orbitope comes in. So orbitope is just the convex cell of an orbit. So that becomes a convex uh, object. And so, so, I mean, in theoretical computer science, we do this all the time. We have some set over which is probably hard to optimize. So we take the convex cell, uh, and we optimize over here, and then we try to figure out how to round it. So you're not gonna get an exact solution probably, but uh, this is something uh, that at least a couple of us have been thinking about how to uh, how stuff. I'm not sure this is addressing your question. I just wanted to make this remark. The first thing you used was a spectral field. There is no, this was the first step. There is no analog in the higher four tensors. Yeah, that's also true. Okay, so uh, I will continue to this next uh, next result, uh, which is probably going to be even more mysterious than this one. Uh, <clears throat> so here, my goal is to prove uh, that if I integrate this exponential density over this unitary orbit of E1, I get this 
like uh, you know a summation and not just any summation it's just a summation which involves n terms and you can you know as a as a theoretical computer scientist you would be delighted because this is something you can compute uh, exactly and efficiently in in <clears throat> in any sense of the word you might imagine <clears throat> so this proof has a, a again a few steps and these steps are very similar okay so the first step reduces this problem um, of integrating a linear function, or sorry, a exponential function or log linear function to an integral over the n-dimensional probability simplex. So what is this object n-dimensional probability in delta one? This is the set of all non-negative vectors in n dimensions with sum up to one. That's why I call it, that's the, that's the reason why the one is there. <clears throat> and why is this true? This is not an obvious fact. Uh, this is true because of formula such as, you know, Bombieri's formula. I mean, this goes by many names, uh, but roughly speaking, it says that you can take any polynomial in the entries of this matrix X, so these x11, x22 are, uh, you know, some, so, so this is the uh, diagonal, the one comma one entry of x, this is the two comma two entries and so on. So if I look at the diagonal of x and I, I look at some, I mean, these mi's, you can, for this talk, you can think mi's are just one, but there could be other integers as well, uh, other positive integers as well. So if you integrate a monomial like this, you get, a similar monomial over the corresponding measure, which is, I mean, the mu delta one is just a Lebesgue measure over, over delta one. So this is a measure that we already know. So this is a, this requires some complex analysis, some basic complex analysis to prove. Uh, it's not difficult, but I, I'm not, I mean, you can see the proof of this in the notes, but, uh, but if you believe this, then because the exponential can be written as some kind of a, uh, you know, a Taylor series involving such polynomials, you can recover this, uh, this integral. Exactly. It's a limiting form. So you, you, you get a whole bunch of equalities, you, you combine them and you add them up and you get this formula. Okay, so it seems pretty bizarre. And I, I mean, doesn't look at all like this was generalized, at least when I first saw this. So how do we then do, uh, you know, how do we go from, you know, okay, so it's still some exponential density on the simplex. So it's not entirely obvious. How do we do this? How do we integrate this? So we move from one continuous set to another continuous set. Well, this is convex. So in principle, we could invoke the heavy machinery of, uh, you know, works in theoretical computer science, such as why Lowash and Simonovitz and Vampala and Kannan and others. And saying, you know, this is just a log concave function over a polytope. What is the problem? Just simply, I mean, just use that technology to do that. Well, we don't have to do that, first of all. And even if you were to do that, we would not get this log one over epsilon type of results, which I think Avi mentioned. But we don't have to do any of that. So, I mean, this is high school or, uh, you know, uh, uh, or, or undergraduate mathematics, which I'm going to show you. So if you take this integral here and just open it up, so you're separating out each coordinate. So this is how we do integration, uh, where we take a domain and we go coordinate by coordinate and, and see what this formula looks like. It turns out that you can just view this formula as convolution of certain functions. So this star is uh, the, you know, so F and G, let's say are two real valued functions that convolution is defined as this integral of this shifted uh, product. And you can prove uh, in a line or so that this integral is nothing but the convolution. And so what? So what if it's a convolution? And if you have a convolution, we know a lot of nice things in particular Laplace transforms come in. Uh, I guess this is all stuff I studied in my undergraduate and I thought, never thought this would be useful, but here it is. Um, so when you have a convolution of functions, you can compute its Laplace transform. So in particular for the exponential, 
the Laplace transform is something very simple. So e to the minus lambda one t is Laplace transform is one over s plus lambda one. And for convolutions, you're just gonna get a product. So we can do this trick that we can view, we can apply the Laplace transform and then take the inverse Laplace transform. I mean, all this needs some justification, but all of this can be done. And literally in three, uh, three lines of proof, you can recover that uh, you get this summation, which is a summation over exponentials involving lambda i's. Well, if, you're, if you do it carefully, you will also recover the ci's exactly, and they will match uh, uh, you know, what is written here. For those of you who are already ahead, maybe already realize that these, these, uh, these constants here uh, are, you know, so, so one over lambda i minus lambda g kind of term, this is a Vandermond, a determinant of the Vandermond matrix. So determinants are lurking behind here. It's not obvious in this proof. Polytopes are lurking behind. So, you know, what is the determinant anyway? Determinant is the summation over the symmetric group. So, uh, so all these objects are here, but if you see this proof, you only maybe get a hint that these things are here. So what is going on here? Um, it's okay if you didn't follow all the steps of this proof. I mean, the point of the slide was to show you that the proofs are indeed pretty elementary and can be done without any reference to any symmetries. Um, so let's consider a slightly more general problem, which is what at least my original motivation was. So instead of looking at the orbit of just E1, we can look at the orbit of any Hermitian matrix lambda, uh, uh, orbit like the unitary conjugation orbit. And I can ask this question about, can we sample from exponential densities on this orbit? Now this question becomes much more interesting and it has a surprising number of applications in a variety of areas. So I guess uh, originally we arrived at it uh, with, with Jonathan when we were looking at uh, maximum entropy distributions over continuous manifolds. Uh, but we realized soon enough that uh, this object is central to many different uh, areas in statistics. Uh, these densities are go by the name of matrix Langevin or Bingham densities. Um, because this is some kind of a, a robust version of minimum eigenvalue problem or, or some kind of a principal component analysis, which is a kind of eigenvalue problem, it has applications in differential privacy this was observed by uh, Kamalika Chaudhary, uh, Sarvati, and Sina. Uh, these functions actually show up in uh, understanding the isotropic constant of convex bodies, in particular works of Gromov, uh, uh, which inspired the work of Klartag, and, and subsequently the work of uh, Sebastian Bubek and Ronan Eldan, who studied entropic barrier, uh, which is nothing but densities like this. Um, which, which, which then the question of whether we can compute these quantities uh, was not, not clear. So, yeah, I mean, these, these results will hopefully be discussed in the workshop in November or December. I don't want to go into that, but there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, different things where such things are applicable. Let me do a, uh, let me do a, the same trick that I did for, uh, for, for, E1. I'm just going to convert it into an integral over the unitary group, okay? So, so if I plug in, uh, if I take a unitary U and I plug in, uh, I replace, you know, X by U lambda U star, I get this rather strange looking, uh, uh, strange looking integral, E to the trace of Y U lambda U star. It turns out that this, density is goes by the name of Harish Chandra Idzik and Zuber density on unitary groups. And it has a whole set of applications uh, in quantum field theory, quantum gravity, string theory, random matrix theory, and free probability. I think Terry Tao has a very nice blog post about it in case you want to read about this. Um, so this question that we asked about sampling from 
an exponential density on a unitary orbit is exactly the same as sampling from the HCI density. Um, and an amazing result uh, and a very deep result. Um, so by Harish Chandra and, and subsequently independently discovered by Itzikson and Zuber is that these integrals have these uh, um, expressions in terms of determinants. So this is, uh, this is just a matrix whose i comma jth entry is e to the y i lambda j. So you can assume without loss of generality essentially that y and lambda are both diagonal and given by y one to y n and lambda one to lambda. So it is, uh, yeah, when we were working on this problem and kind of we, uh, we needed something like this, uh, it was a bit, I mean, I must say the first feeling I always remember, I mean, this, the fact that this integral is a determinant, uh, definitely raises the question, why is it a determinant? I mean, it could be, it could have a formula, but that formula doesn't necessarily have to involve a determinant. And it was not obvious at all in the rank one case that I described in the previous slide that it is a determinant, but you can show that it is also a determinant if you really care about it. The bottom line is that these are efficiently computable formulas for some really unwieldy looking integrals but natural in the context of uh, various disciplines. In fact, the history of this uh, formula is a little bit, uh, you know, goes backward in time. Harish Chandra, who was trying to, uh, to, to, to uh, extend the theory of Fourier analysis to semi-simple Lie groups, came up with what is called the HC formula, the Harish Chandra formula, which is a strict and a major generalization of this HCIZ formula. So I and Z discovered this special case for the unitary group so much later than Harish Chandra discovered the, 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 the formula. And I hope uh, Jonathan will mention this formula in this talk. And it is not at all um, uh, uh, a miracle that determinants show up. In fact, these integrals are integrals over Lie groups, compact Lie groups. And to every compact Lie group, there is an associated whale group, which is the finite counterpart of it. So the summations are signed summations or available groups. And uh, it turns out that for several interesting groups like the unitary group, it's a single determinant. You can look at other groups like symplectic group. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a sum of small number, maybe two or three determinants. And you can also look at the uh, you know, orthogonal group. They're also, it, it, it boils down to determinants. There's no theorem that it'll always be a determinant, but um, for all cases that we care about, and for those of you who know the Lie class, I mean, uh, the classification theorem of Lie groups, there are really three major classes of uh, Lie groups. So we have a determinantal formula for all of them. And then there are these exceptional Lie groups where these are just finite. Anyway, so all that uh, 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 you will hopefully uh, be interested in knowing. Um, the proof of the HCIZ formula is not the same as the one I presented before. The reason is that simplex has a lot of structure. Its coordinates are essentially independent. The moment you go to higher, uh, even rank two orbits, orbits of rank two matrices, you, 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 uh, the structure breaks down. And for a long time, uh, I mean, I should tell you this, for a long time, Jonathan and I were trying to extend these results using the moment map. Um, and studying the push forward of these densities under the moment map, it turns out that these densities are much, uh, are not very well understood. It turns out that there is another projection formula, which really does the following. It takes a matrix, it looks at all principal uh, minors, let's say one cross one minor, two cross two minor, n cross n minor, computes the eigenvalues of each of these matrices, and that's the mapping. So this, this is a different mapping, which maps a unitary matrix to a, a higher dimensional space and not just a diagonal. This is the Raleigh map, uh, eigenvalues interlace and so on. So it's described by some very nice combinatorics and uh, you know, it's called the Raleigh polytope. It is a polytope, it's called the Raleigh polytope. And once we identify the right mapping, we can recover a proof of the HCIZ formula, at least in this setting. <laughs> So the bottom line is that integrals over adjoint orbits of Lie groups reduce to finite determinant-like summations. 
Uh, this is again a fairly general uh, uh, statement which can be made precise. Okay, so I think I'm at the end of my time, so I'll conclude and then take all the questions that you might have. So in this talk, uh, hopefully um, through these examples that are presented or some very natural problems over orbits of you know, Lie group actions, you got a sense that um, uh, the algebra and analysis kind of the interplay between algebra and analysis in the proofs. Uh, more generally, continuous symmetries can be useful to design optimization and sampling algorithms over non-convex manifold. In fact, this is uh, this was also uh, uh, kind of the, the core conceptual message of the talks before. Uh, Non-convexity is just uh, uh, you know it, it, it's just anything that is not convex. But there may be tractable cases of non-convex optimization and sampling, and a very interesting class of such objects are non-convex objects which have symmetries like orbits. And often these results are obtained through deep and hidden connections uh, and, and the role symmetries plays reduce the problem from manifolds to polytopes and subsequently to some discrete problems. So it's really uh, fascinating, all this stuff. There is a growing body of work. Uh, so again, a partial list, uh, you know, I think, uh, um, much has been talked about already. I mean, the work of uh, Gerd Gurwitz, Olivia Victorson, who started this, uh, uh, their line of work and applications to um, very far removed problems in complexity theory, such as identity testing, um, you know, developing methods for optimizing um, functions over geodesic sets or geodesically convex optimization, uh, first order methods, second order methods, some really nice a series of work. I'm not citing all the papers here. Uh, brass camp leap constant, something that, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's something in mathematics. And again, trying to understand or compute these constants has interesting connections with symmetries. Um, I think I already mentioned some of these other applications like interior point methods, uh, uh, computing a certain type of quantum entropy, which is uh, something that Jonathan and I did in, in a paper in 2020. And more recently, we discovered some connections with physics, random matrix theory, and privacy. Uh, and there is, I'm sure there are works I'm missing. Uh, there is, uh, um, so, so apologies in advance if I missed your work. So the part two of this uh, series would be Lie theory basics uh, and extending, or at least giving you a sense of how to even formulate these two results that I presented in the general setting. With this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions, details of this talk and the next can be, uh, you can view them in this archive paper. Thank you. Questions? Hold on. So for the integral formula, can you do that over the wheels of the orthogonal matrices? Or are you using the complex numbers in some essential way? Yes, it is. Uh, it's a very good question, actually. So that's uh, one of the uh, open problems. Uh, I mean, much of this, uh, so the, the complex numbers are essential, at least in the proof of its CIG formula. So when you move towards, let's say, the symmetric, a set of symmetric matrices, we don't have such beautiful formulas, unfortunately. But that's something we are, I mean, that's something we are planning to think about. We're already thinking about it. So I'd be very happy to talk more to whoever asked this question. Another question. All right, so to, to bootstrap onto, onto that, Nishit, can you give a sense of what actually breaks down? Is, is there this Bombieri style formula that breaks down for the symmetric case? Absolutely, yeah. But that's where you need complex. Uh, I mean, those integrals are over complexes. Yeah, the push forwards measure don't uh, are not so nice anymore when you're working over reels. And I'm sure Jonathan being there can uh, tell you much more about this.
Yeah, so so I do, I do think that the, the you can get some kind of integral formula. It's just this it's this push forward that it's the measure that becomes the problem. The integral, I think you can get some kind of determinant type thing. It's just it doesn't it doesn't kind of lead to this like nice measure on this on this Rayleigh polytope like it does in the complex case. So it's not uniform. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think so. so. What, so I think uh, you know what what he's to parse what he's saying is that there is a mapping that takes you from this orbit to a polytope, and then you need to go back also. So you sample something in this uh, polytope, you need to go back, and this going back uh, becomes messy or or probably not uh, possible in other settings. Like a change of variables formula or something is is that sort of that's right. Not, it's not explicit. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so this is, I mean, so so this is very natural that it shows up in random matrix theory. I mean, you know, so I, if anybody has studied, uh, uh, you know, this stuff, you know that there are three types of ensembles, right? I mean, and, and the best one is the GOE, the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And then the other ones are slightly more ugly to deal with. And that's exactly the same kind of difficulty you experience here. Uh, Nicole's had a question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, uh... Thank you for the talk. I mean, I'm speaking for, from very limited knowledge about this, but, um, you know, so when you're translating the problem, the original problem to, you know, the polytope problem, let's say, I mean, at some point you, you use like a deep inequality or deep theorem. So, I mean, at least in the examples that you were showing, you know, say the, the spectral theorem you, you use at some point or uh, this Bombieri formula. And I'm curious, I mean, um, these are things that you have in hand that then, you know, is it, you know, you, you have some intuition as to what is the structure you're looking for, and then you, you know, you, you have this uh, other theorems, or, you know, how, how does this work? I mean, it, it, could it be the case that these theorems to, that, that you precisely need to make this connection are more difficult? I'm, I'm just curious in general about, you know, how, how things uh, work uh, here. Um, I would appreciate any comment. Thank you. So I would be uh, lying if I say that this is how I viewed the, the world a year ago. Um, I mean, often we got these results by uh, some series of coincidence. And then when we reflect upon them, we start seeing lots of patterns. And then we, uh, you know, so I, maybe Jonathan has a different point of view here. I mean, this is all joint work with him. But uh, from my point of view, there is still a lot of mystery in how uh, we go from certain problems to their, you know, to, to, to convex, uh, into the convex world. I mean, and that is already illustrated in this HCIZ thing, where for a very long time, uh, we were stuck with the moment map. It's not like things are not known about the moment map. I mean, what happens to the push forward measure of an exponential density on an orbit under the moment map? Things are known. It is known that it is piecewise polynomial, uh, but it's not as, yeah, and, but you know, nobody knows what these polynomials are going to be. So, whereas, you know, by going to a different, uh, uh, different, uh, a different uh, way to project the matrix into, you know, you, you get a different set of, uh, yeah, you get a very nice, easy structure. So, but I'll let Jonathan comment on that as well. I mean, at least, at least the way I think of the Bombieri inner product showing up, or Bombieri formula showing up here was, yeah, more like coincidence. I mean, it was we didn't really know what else to do, and that sort of worked. Uh, and then that didn't generalize, so we tried to find some other things that might. I mean, that was kind of that's kind of how I remember. It. Um, and I don't, I still don't really know the, the full picture. Of, like, I mean, there, there are theorems, and there are like you know ways that this stuff will generalize in the next talk. But I don't beyond that, I you know I start grasping again. Maybe it's not so surprising that uh, when you look at objects that are closed under conjugation, the result will be dependent only on the eigenvalue. So in both results, that's what happens. What that's correct. What the dependence might be may not be obvious. Uh, in the first case, it's pretty obvious. In the second, it's quite, you know, maybe mysterious. But at least you expect some formula that depends only on the eigenvalue. And that's, uh, yeah, at least so far you can get. I mean, we, I mean, just to contrast, we don't have formulas involving Gaussian integrals, right? I mean, so it is, uh, it is a bit uh, surprising that we have like clear formulas and, and that also involving determinants. 
so that we can demystify uh, because you know the fact that determinants arise is because the veil group has uh, some structure um, but you know i mean to what extent all this stuff is true i think this is a work in progress um but i feel quite positive uh, and also i think uh, i mean i really appreciate the work that avi and his uh, set of co-authors are doing which is i would say a level uh uh further because they are looking at general representations and there i think there is even more scope of discovering structure okay that's it let's uh, thank the sheets for a nice talk thank you